Hi, welcome to Preps Plus Podcast, episode 30, brought to you by Sterling Auto Group. I'm Joshua Hart, sports editor here at The Daily News. I'm here with Jason Leskew, our Preps reporter. Say hello, Jason. I am also on the uh, Monstars AAU team. Uh, I have uh, finally had the time to rejoin the podcast here a little bit. It's uh, I think it's been the past couple of weeks been Jason primarily interviewing uh, guests, and uh, we will have an interview with uh, Three Rivers Christians, Ryan Ransom, later uh, later in this episode. Um, he set the school record with 42 points uh, just last week, so um, pretty talented kid there. He's just a sophomore, uh, but been playing basketball for the high school team for about three years, so uh, that's an interesting interview later. Uh, but first, we uh, we kind of wanted to, to break a, away from the typical, uh, you know, kind of thoughts and opinions on, on local teams, um, since we'll be doing plenty of that once playoff season comes around, and get to, uh, there was a story uh, come out a couple days ago from the Seattle Times about a new bill that, uh, that was introduced to the state legislature um, that could bring oversight to the WIAA. Um, obviously, WIA right now operates as a nonprofit organization, uh, and that, that ruling has been challenged most recently by Bellevue parents who felt they were uh, unjustly um, punished uh, for uh, recruiting violations uh, that were first uh, reported by the Seattle Times. So that's kind of where it is. Uh, if you haven't got a chance to read the Seattle Times story uh, by Nathan Joyce, it's really interesting. Um, but uh, just get, give me your first frontline thoughts here, Jason, on, on this, uh, what, what a new bill and, and what state oversight could mean for the WIA. Well, you know, as, as someone who has always been pretty interested in politics, my, the big thing to me, uh, as far as the WIA and their structure, their you know, tax status, all those things like that, because they are basically, you know, the, the employees of the WIA are making a living off public school functions. The majority of the member schools are public. There's a few privates in there, but, you know, uh, I've always wondered how, I mean, they've had to walk quite a tightrope in order to maintain uh, their nonprofit status. And, and this isn't the you know, the, the Washington WIA isn't the only um, state, you know, prep sports uh, governing body that's, had, that's, that's dealt with this in recent years. Uh, the WIA of Wisconsin, in fact, uh, this has been a, a topic with them. Uh, and one thing that the WIA doesn't do as well as, I, as say, Wisconsin is their transparency. You know, you can find tax forms and find some salaries uh, you know online through public databases and uh, but it's not nearly I think as thorough as it could be and I think that's going to be that's going to hurt the WIA um, in in the long run in this bill if they if they don't agree with certain points and say you know what we just don't want this at all you know whereas uh, in Wisconsin they have said you know it, this it wouldn't change anything because we're already so transparent that, hey, um, you know, who at this point we're, we're not objecting to this, but, you know, there's nothing that would really change. And with the WIA, I think it would really change. A lot of things would really change. Yeah, I, I'd like to kind of put my first thoughts out there is that this comes from two reasons, right? Is it comes from um, so it's being introduced by a Spokane Republican, um, let me, Michael Baumgartner, um, and Bellevue Democrat Patty Cooter. Um, and but there, there's motivations behind any bill that's obviously put into legislation. And this comes from basically two incidents, right? Is it comes from the Bellevue investigation that the WAIA basically was the Roger Goodell and had full mm -hmm. executive power to. D rule on something um, and, and go about their investigation in their own way. Uh, so I can see why they're upset um, f from that point of view and they, they want there to be some sort of rule or legislation that says this is how this should proceed. Um, the second thing of course is the basketball tournament. We've been talking about this since, or coaches have been talking about this since it went to eight teams. Uh, that 
it's depriving kids of the state experience, whatever you want to call the <laughs> state experience, right? But the fact of the matter is, A, they put it back up to 12 teams. So you're already part of the way there. B, they weren't making, they were losing money off of, off of a 16 team state tournament. And part of this bill is to mandate that it goes back to 16 teams. And uh, I think, I don't know which reporter tweeted how, uh, but when the article came out, they said, uh, you know, Washington State will only jump on board if they can force people to attend the nine o'clock or the 9 a.m. consolation <laughs> games. Uh, because the, quite frankly, the 16 team tournament was, wasn't was making money. And I get we're in this for the kids, but you, you still have to pay the bills on, on the dome rentals and all of these things. And I, I continuously look at Oregon's model and I say, do these kids not get the state experience? Because the Oregon's model is they basically have a similar format and they have a regionals, right? It, I don't know if it's technically called regionals. I think it's actually called the first round of the state tournament, but they're at their local high schools. Is that any less of a state experience? When they go to Coos Bay and play at Marshfield High School, is that any less of a state experience? You're still playing games with people that you, you get an extra game with, with your friends and your family and you get an extra game in uniform, all of these things. It's no less of a state experience if, if the format works that way. Uh, I don't think Oregon is missing out because they're not playing in the Tacoma Dome or the Sun Dome. Um, quite frankly, if you've been in those arenas, I'm sure it's really cool to play, but it's not like, it's not that much different, I feel like, than playing in a high school gym. The stakes are different. That's what makes the state experience. So whether you play the regionals at your local high school or you play it in the Sun Dome, it doesn't make a difference as far as how you experience that and how you how you feel about that situation. So I try to stay away from that, that whole like argument of the state experience. You're depriving kids of the state experience. I don't think kids believe that. I don't think they're like, uh, we didn't get a, you know, our, our regional game wasn't in the Tacoma Dome. Like, it was just in our local high school. Like, that's not, you're not depriving them of a state experience. Washington is one of the few states where they put them in these big gyms and they put them in these domes and they have a separate thing. Like I said, you're playing at Marshfield High School if you're a 3A Oregon State basketball team. No offense to Marshfield High School, it's a nice high school, but you're not, we're not playing in grand stadiums here. Mm -hmm. Not only that, uh, especially when, just to go back to football season, uh, remember what the Tacoma Dome is, is cement with a thin, right. <laughs> you know, it's like a thin green tarp-like uh, mat, you know, and you're basically playing on concrete. So I think a lot of kids would probably prefer, uh, you know, to play a full, you know, 40-so-odd right. minutes on uh in Centralia, where it's a nice turf field, right. they get to enjoy the elements. Where um, there are elements, you know, and not just uh, high pressure sodium right. lighting. It's, it's not. It's not the venue that makes the game important. It's the game. It's the stakes. Mm -hmm. The reason everyone says road to the dome, right, is not because they really, really want to go visit the Yakima Sun Dome, right? Like <laughs> that's not. It's Spokane Arena. Different story. That's a fantastic arena. Uh, <laughs> But nobody's like, oh, I really want to get to the dome because they want to get to that that level where they can play two more games. Mm -hmm. They can go on the road somewhere and sit in a hotel with their with their you know their friends and their families and experience a couple days. That's why I think Oregon works great. Mm -hmm. You're going to Marshfield High School, it, you know, like y y they're sending eight teams to Marshfield High School, and it's more about the experience and the stakes and getting to go away. Heck, you know, like for the teams that don't make the state tournament, right? For let's say the six, the well now that they're, they're 12, the four teams that get eliminated out of regionals, mm -hmm. right? And they really wish they were at the Tacoma Dome, right? Because they could go stay in hotels. Go on a camping trip. Yeah, <laughs> like, seriously. Like, you know, it's just, it's about, it's about the experience and about the stakes. And that's why, like, the, the whole state experience argument to me of, of 
that that the Wibka often makes it is flawed fundamentally. That there's tradition, and that's people don't like to step away from tradition. But fact of the matter is this this 18 tournament and now 12 team tournament works out pretty well. Like there's a few days, and usually the best teams emerge on top for the most part, especially now with the RPI rankings, even though there's lots of flaws with that, most of the time the best teams win. Right, and and not just to, to kind of bring another element into your, your argument that the state experience isn't the venue, it's the experience. Um, if you had uh, different venues, different locations for state tournaments, uh, there's no question in my mind that uh, area businesses would be thrilled. I mean, you know, right now you have Yakima Hotels, Spokane Hotels, and, uh, you know, obviously Tacoma Hotels that are benefiting local businesses. Um, shoot, the local businesses, you know, profit off of us when we go to cover games. There are so many other venues that I've been to <laughs> that are better than Yakima and Tacoma by a lot yeah, yeah. that have that have the you know lodging and have the restaurants and all these other things you need that would in my opinion just open their arms to a state tournament right. you know just like cities open their arms for a Super Bowl right you know so and, and that's the thing is these these domes cost a lot to rent out right which mm -hmm. is why Oregon does it at high schools mm -hmm. is like it. I've been in the Tacoma Dome and I've been in the Sun Dome. I've never played there, so I don't know that. I don't know how, what it's like to play on the court. But outside of the Spokane Arena, at least as far as basketball goes, right? I wouldn't get. It looks more, awful. I wouldn't get more jazzed up about playing in a big dome where teams notoriously shoot horrendous, <laughs> right? At the Yakima Sun Dome. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's just a dome, that, a kind of dusty. Yeah, know, it's not even nice dome like it's cool that the, they can fit a lot of people in but like you have courts that separate the two you know like there's a lot of sound that's just going on mm -hmm. like like I said outside of the Spokane Arena which is a fantastic arena that's really really cool and they have these like lockers that go like back underneath right that's like these actual lockers that like you know semi pro hockey teams come out of like mm -hmm. outside of the Spokane Arena I haven't seen a venue that would be like this has to be played here because it would deprive kids of anything less. Well, there is the key arena remodel coming, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah. that's true. They're not going to be able to attract an NBA team, so they might as well attract, you know, Gonzaga Prep and, <laughs> and Foss and those guys. So. Exactly. But to get back to the politics of it all, is state oversight feasible? Yes. In my opinion, I, it's, it's, I, to me, it's not that complicated, and I think... Like I, when I brought up transparency earlier, I think that's going to be one, um, you know, a, a pillar of any uh, momentum in getting this passed in, in the state legislatures. You know, you, you look at it, and this is something I do with anything, is I look at financials. Uh, covering the NFL, I did this with as much as I could, baseball, basketball, every, down to concessions to figure out what a team might be making. The WIA is less transparent than professional sports teams, than, than the three I've covered. And that's saying a lot because uh, the Raiders, by NFL standards, are uh, you know the, the least cooperative, uh, or one of the least cooperative teams and the most uh, you know stonewalling, and it just getting information out of there was, was incredibly difficult. The WIA, Posts virtually nothing. There's there's virtually no information coming out of there. And I think if I'm a politician that wants to pass this, that's what I get up. That's a soapbox I stand on and say, hey, you know, if you weren't disturbed by, you know, if you weren't not an angry parent from from Bellevue, this is why you should be for this. Right. Here, here's I, I'd like to kind of pick pick from this story, and uh, it's a, it's a well written story by Nathan Joyce, and uh, he's he's always been a good reporter, nice guy. Um, this is from uh, Michael Baumgartner, the Spokane Republican. The WI is spending public dollars, but having oversight by the OSPI, the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, that will have a structure that will have a better sense of process and fairness. Um, 
So that's the that's the argument, right? Is that there's public dollars being spent mm -hmm. because the schools pay a membership fee, and I think in this story, yeah, it's there's the WI's second highest source of revenue. How they how they pay their bills uh, is from these fees. They generate six hundred twenty five thousand dollars in 2015-16. Um, that that just comes from fees, right? And so it's public money, yeah. right? Each school pays whatever amount per year. I don't know exactly what it equates out to, but they all pay a fee to be part of the WIA so that they can compete in events from uh, debate club to forensics to cheerleading to basketball and baseball and football mm -hmm. and all that good stuff. Um, that's kind of why the argument is being made like there yeah. should be some state oversight because these are public funds being spent. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna argue the other side of this. Okay. Is I truly believe if you pay a fee to be a part of an organization, right? Whether it be a country club or what, these schools don't have to make the, the there are schools that opt out of the WIA. Mm -hmm. There there are schools that say oh, athletics aren't that important. Very, very, very few. Very, very, uh, yes, very, very, very few. But it gets brought up at city, city or not city council, uh, school board meetings mm -hmm. all the time, right? Look through any minutes mm -hmm. and you will see almost every school about once a year bring it up like some parent will ask, do we have to pay this fee, mm -hmm. right? Because they have to get the fee approved every year mm -hmm. and all that good stuff. And my thing is, if you're paying a fee to be a part of a club, you have to follow the club's rules. If there was enough outrage of the WIA and schools were sick of it, then there would be another entity that started up. There's no, there's nothing against another organ. There's no rule against another organization starting up and saying we're the the WSAA. You know, like there's nothing against that. But all of these schools have been have agreed to pay this fee and agreed to be a part of this organization. And so you play by the organization's rules. And as much as much kind of flack as the WI gets for certain things, let's look at what they've done for the past, I don't know how many years. At least at least since 73 is when they start keeping their records on their website. So mm -hmm. let's just say for the last 40 years, mm -hmm. right? What they've done is they provide an opportunity for millions I think at this point of kids right to play in an athletic competition that has some sense of process and fairness now everyone's going to disagree on the rules and how we should go about ranking teams how many teams should be in where should these teams come from every system has its flaws like even the MLB they people are like well should there be two wild cards or one wild card NCAA tournament should there be 64 teams or 68 teams should eight teams get in the playoffs or four teams there's always going to be a sense of somebody's getting jobbed out of an opportunity but the WIA for the most part has done a very good job at just just being the WIA and being an organization that allows all these schools to collaborate and work together to award kids the opportunity to play sports. What I fear, what I fear is, why do we have to add that to a list of the Office of Public Super, the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction's responsibilities when they have a lot going on elsewhere, and we're we're now not only spending public dollars to pay a fee to be part of this organization, we're now spending public dollars in terms of hours spent covering and monitoring what the WIA is doing when for the most part, for the past 40 years, they've operated just fine. The counter argument to that, I think, is that, you know, as, as you noted earlier, uh, state tournaments are one of the biggest, if not the, I think, or no, the biggest expenditure, that I think it is the, the biggest The biggest source of revenue, and I think, believe, I believe, the biggest expenditure. Yeah. They make uh, about 2.3, so the reporting here from Joyce is, 2.3 million dollars in 2015-16 was the revenue. I don't know how much the rental costs and all of those mm -hmm. things are, but just from ticket sales uh, and everything from their state tournaments. Mm -hmm. So I imagine the rental fees and everything are expensive, but that's just the revenue. 
Right, and and the expen no the expenditures I is something I've reviewed. And it, it's it's I think for a year or close to they come around into the million dollar range, two million dollar range. Just going off the top of my head, it's been a, a month or two since I looked at this, but the WIA does that for one of the main you know advantages to that for them is advertising. They can go up there and say Les Schwab Tire Center. Uh, w, uh, you know, Washington Dairy Farmers and, and things like that. Um, and you can remove a lot of those expenditures by placing those um, competitions at other locations uh, and that are already covered by public funds. I think there, there should be, there be, you know, a stipend or some sort of um, financial incentive for schools to have them there because there's another there's the added cost of hey well you know you're tearing up our fields and there's something to that but the reason in my opinion that they have the state tournaments at these locations is just money I don't I think that you could cut that fee in, in, in expenditures at least in half by you know streamlining it through the public school system yeah, I mean, Oregon does it really well. Um, yeah, I, I think I think you're right uh, that you. But part of this bill is not. I don't. Is part of it is increasing it to a 16 team state tournament, which I believe, I want to say is four or five days. Right now, I want to say it might be five days. But anyway, there's a lot of games that don't matter in uh -huh. a 16 team state sure. tournament. Sure. Um, sure. But when you increase it to that much. Like that, that's what the bill is trying to mandate too. Mm -hmm. as, as you know, the, the, it's basically two arguments, right? right? A sixteen team state tournament or a p super supervision of a nonprofit organization that right. runs mostly with public funds. Funds, yeah. Um, so they're kind of two arguments thrown into one bill. I'll, I'll play. I'll which play is it. politics, right? <laughs> which is politics, and that's the that's the unfortunate part. About about this bill, in my opinion, this is the biggest flaw. Is okay because it's a state bill. It's not a group of schools coming together, you know, and saying, "Hey, um, why don't we do it this way?" This is the state legislature coming together and starting to discuss this. And you know, as we talk about all the time, government is. And I know you love saying this. This is one of Josh, Josh's favorite political phrases. Government um, is. I'll let you say it. Governments not supposed to be it um, was not designed to be uh, efficient oh yeah yeah that was a poli sci professor told me that when it, i was in college this very government true. was de not designed to be efficient it's very true like when does a good thing ever come out of congress at any level in a day or two you know it never happened ever uh so that's the biggest problem with this is okay now it becomes something where you know if if a 16 team tournament fails miserably you gotta wait like two years to fix right. it and that's the thing is like there's and there's been a lot of uh good reporting across the state of when it was at 16 team state tournament they were losing money mm -hmm. that, that this was the this is why they moved to an 18 state tournament right was they were losing money from these tournaments mm -hmm. you know like a lot of it is paid by advertisers mm -hmm. a lot of it is paid through ticket sales uh, these type of thing, you know, a lot of it's paid through fees. These type of things allow the WIA to give kids the opportunity. Um, so, yeah, I kind of lost where I was going with that. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's it's an interesting bill. I, I don't see it happening, uh, quite right. frankly. Um, I get why people want state oversight uh, of it, mm -hmm. but... At, at its heart, it's just a nonprofit organization that's taking funds from public entities. Just like a construction company will make a bid, right, for a project within the city, and the city will use public funds to pay this construction company to do X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make the construction company need a governing body, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, here's here's the the catch twenty two. I could see uh, politicians campaigning on this in the upcoming elections. I don't know. To I an extent, it's... or, or the, it's going to be, I'm sure somebody's going to ask the question, and I could see the a situation where it becomes part of the, the uh, 
political discussion as uh, from a campaign standpoint. I don't think it's a major. I think there's obviously bigger uh, issues to discuss like crime and education and not sports, you know, around education. But there's, there's, I could see somebody or, or a couple uh, folks campaigning on an issue like this. Yeah, I think it's small enough. I think in our sports world, we get wrapped up in like sports art yeah. and everything. And like, quite frankly, just a small percentage of people play sports. Like, right. uh, let's like take Kelso, for example. What do they have? Like 1,200 students mm -hmm. and maybe 300 play sports. I don't, I'd actually I'm, probably argue maybe even less. I mean, if you, here's, if you exclude the, the track and cross country, why if would you, you exclude that? I know you, you do. I'm just saying because. The reason I, because it makes it easier to calculate. <laughs> right. But I think there's probably about 300 athletes. Right? Like, I would say, like, at most, in so, like, some of these bigger schools, like, you mm -hmm. have 25% of people. And, like... The, and that's a high percentage. Right. There's basically two entities upset about lack of state oversight right now, right? It's WIBCA, right? The Washington Basketball Association, Coaches Association, mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, Bellevue. Right. So... Uh, yeah. I think I think there's there's more than that, and this is why I say I, th I can see people campaigning. Is I know there there are parents who dislike the WIA. There are coaches uh, in different sports that you know um, dislike the the WIA. And one of the biggest things is the coaches have no say, you know, or or a very minor say in some of the things that go on. So yeah, yeah. I mean, that, like I said, there are flaws. I think for the most part. WI has done a really, really good job of providing great opportunities mm -hmm. for the past 40 years. Mm -hmm. We can argue all day about the process. What they have done they, over the long which, term has been successful. They, yeah, in which yeah. they go about awarding certain trophies to certain teams. But at the end of the day, have kids gotten the opportunity to play sports in Washington State? Right. Yes. Has that experience over the past 40 years been positive? Yes. Right. Have certain teams gotten... Uh, you know, jobbed out of an extra game here or there, an yeah. extra chance at a trophy. But that's going to happen probably in any structure. Right. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, we'll jump right into that interview with uh, Three Rivers Christians, Ryan Ransom, and uh, and yeah, and uh, we'll again this podcast brought to you by Sterling Auto Group. We'll see you next week to talk about uh, probably more basketball things or wrestling or actual sporting things. Um, <laughs> But I uh, appreciate you stopping by, and we'll, we'll see you soon. All right, so I'm here with Ryan Ransom, Three Rivers Christian Basketball, averaging about 19 points a game this season. Uh, and we're, we're kind of at the midway point. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the season been like for you? It's been pretty solid. We've picked up a few really key wins so far. Of course, we've only played two in-league games, but... It's looking good down the stretch, mm -hmm. you know, to know that I think it's top three teams go to districts. It's either top right. three or top two. I'm pretty yeah. sure it's top three. Yeah, to three know is. who we have to beat and know which games are going to be close. And we're scouting those teams. Right. You know, we, we know what we're going to be doing going in. And it's, it's going well. It's going well. Okay. You know, I, I, do, I failed to mention you're a sophomore. Which yeah, is yeah. averaging 19 points a game, um, which is even which is you know averaging 19 points a game for any senior usually is a team leader. As a sophomore team leader, how how has that been? You know, it, it's been it's been it's been pretty nice. But for most of those points, it's there's somebody who's throwing me an assist. You know, right. So like this last game where I had the 42, you know, Wyatt had 10 10 assists or mm -hmm. Gabe had. Nine ten rebounds, you know, and those guys play a big role in it as well. Right, that game where you had forty two points, that yeah. you, you had previously scored what thirty eight in another game this season. I had I had scored thirty something against the Wishka team. Okay, yeah. How? Uh, first off, what was the reaction from you when you found out how many points you had scored? Um, I was. I wasn't even really focused on. I was just glad, you know, we're one and zero. That's right. the way to start out the league season, knowing that after the first game you're on top and you're already set up to go deep. Okay, that's, that's more important than points, in my opinion, is to get the wins. Okay, and at what point was it uh, that you learned how many points you had scored that night? I found that out with about two minutes left when I got pulled out of the game. Got it. 
Yeah, and the stats guy came up to me and he's like, "Congratulations, you broke your own, your own record." And that right. was not, that was always it's always great to hear something like that from your coach. Right. Yeah. And coach, what did uh, get a game ball or what did Coach Tingle do for you? Coach, he just kind of let it roll right off, okay. which is nice because you don't want to attract too much attention to it because then you you could create tension on a team or something sure. like that, and we just want to roll right through it and just keep things going. Okay. Um, and going into this season. Did you have the expectation, or, or was there a team expectation that you were likely to be, you know, the the scoring leader through half the season? I I knew going into the season that I was I was gonna have a good year okay. with uh, all the the countless training in the off season. It, it we knew it was gonna pay off sooner or later. Okay. Um, I knew that the team was gonna be a lot better this year. You know, I mean, right. in the past couple of years we've been well, we've had. In two years in a row, we've had two six foot five guys, and of course this year our tallest guy is six foot one two on a six foot two on a good day. You know? Right. So it's definitely hard to get rebounds, but as a whole, I think what we've expected is happening. Okay. And it's, it's looking pretty good. Okay. Um, as far as the the off season, you know, training that you were talking about. Uh, do you go to roots or what do you do in the off season? Most of it is. Well, I do cross country and okay. track. Oh, got it. Yeah. Okay. So that's that takes care of a lot of the conditioning, right. you know. And you can go out and run ten miles, and yeah. then you go home. You work on the ball handling in the driveway for a little <laughs> bit, which is the same for because right. uh, every single kid besides one kid on our cross country team played basketball this year. Right. Which is great. Yeah, the one B one B type of deal, right? Yeah. Where everybody's an athlete on. Everybody's transferring to the different sports. Right. Um, so uh, talk about how, so how how hard is it to transition your body from you know cross country season to basketball season? I know that you know obviously it helps you stay in in shape and stay lean, but you know the the acceleration is obviously different yeah. in the two activities, two sports. So how how is it, is there a process uh, or, or you know length of time that it takes you to kind of fully transition into the basketball season? The length of time usually isn't the same. Okay. Um, it differs from year to year. It depends on, well, last year, I was the only person who went state, and this year the whole team did, so we did more of team practices that last week of the season for cross country, mm -hmm. and that changed how, because basketball started just the week after. Right. So that changed the workouts to more of a team workouts that we knew going in that it was, it was going to be more that way. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you go into the first practice of the year, you're thinking, oh, I just went out and ran five miles, I feel great. And then you're going to set a lines, and when you're having to bend down and touch every single line, right. you're not feeling quite as good. Right. So it was it was good to know that this year was good. It wasn't going to take quite as long, and mm -hmm. it was it turned out that way, which is nice. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I know one thing I, I don't think the majority of people appreciate is just how uh, the kind of shape that a cross country runner has to stay in. Everybody thinks, all right, you know, you're, you're probably skinny, you can run long distances, but that's just leg. People don't realize a lot of cross country runners, uh, their entire body, you know, you have to exercise your entire body in yeah. it to, to be an effective runner. Um, I'm sure that helps it, being that, you know, the entire team was a state yeah. contender and, you know, how did, has that? Have you seen that translate? You know the difference from last year to this year. Yeah, I have a little bit. Um, every single year, I kind of have the same problem. I mean, I'm five eleven, one hundred thirty pounds. Yeah. You know, I'm 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 just about a stick. So right. when I drive into the key, sometimes I just get bumped right back out, and that, that's all right. I mean, we get a couple of boos from the crowd. It's not that big of a deal. Uh -huh. You know. So going into the season, it's it's a little. <laughs> It's a little rough when you come to the first practice. Maybe you don't get every single rebound because the other kids have been, well, they've been working out, working out, ready for basketball because some of them only play basketball, you know, mm -hmm. and so they're in the gym and they're they're working pure on strength. You know, they might hit the treadmill or the elliptical for a little bit, but they're working mostly on making sure that they're able to block out the key better or mm -hmm. your post or working on your arm strength if you're wanting to shoot farther out, I guess, or something like that. But when you're running, it's more of like core. Right. To you have to work on that. I know you do. We do a lot of squats, and that's 
that doesn't really translate over very much into basketball. Mm-hmm. I guess it translates over into jumping higher, but right. that's basically it. Okay. Um, and so we have, a, there's going to be a story coming out Friday. We have in our area five uh, underclassmen who are leading the team in scoring. You're obviously one of them. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a unique thing because especially at varsity level for boys or girls basketball, uh, you know, most of the teams are, are predominantly upperclassmen. You know, yeah. a player starts at JV level and then works their way up. And uh, some of the, the better ones, you know, start as freshmen yeah. varsity, but but most don't. Um, and so, it, you know, coaches in the area have said, hey, this is, sure, we've seen, we may have seen it before a little bit, but to have five underclassmen leading the teams and scoring, yeah. you know, is it, pretty crazy. You know, you, you have. I'm sure you might have a good insight into the, you know, the process of, uh, of young athletes in the area. What have you seen, that that might lead to that? To be an underclassman just leading the team. Right. Well, I think a big part of it is that we're a one B school, so right. we don't have the luxury of having the C squad and the right. JV team. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be playing on the C squad team when I was a freshman. Compared to when I was in eighth grade, I was on the varsity team because there was only eight kids drafted in high school that year. So when you're already playing, I mean, you gotta think. I get five years of varsity time. Right. So for that's four years until I hit my senior year, and that's when it really changes because that's when you're you're going all out because you know this is it. But. When you get the experience at an eighth grade level going against a senior who's uh-huh. well, he's that much older than you, and he might be huge in year five, three, 98 pounds in, in the eighth right. grade, right. and you're out there just doing your best, it's, it's hard. So right. I think a big reason why I'm, I'm doing so well is because this is my third year now. Okay. You know? Um, so it's, I mean, yeah, I'm an underclassman, but I've been playing playing on that level for a while and you see the same kids each year right but it's the same it's the same thing with uh Wyatt who's on our team he started as an eighth grader too so him him and I have been in the same boat there for a while okay and did you uh play any uh you know junior league uh basketball anything like that before the eighth grade I did okay I, I played on the Highlander Hoop Club team okay. from kindergarten to seventh grade. Okay. And that was that was very intense. Okay. Yeah. That was we played do you know you know who Riley Noah is? Or, I do know. Oh yeah. No, he had twenty one um, points last night actually. Yeah, yeah, we would play against his team and he had Shaw Anderson and basically yeah. the whole Kelso team and those were not fun practices. I bet. <laughs> when you're trying to drive in there and you you can't because you just get shoved out by Shaw and it's like yeah. you know, that's that sucks. But do you know what? It, it gets you better. Right. It, for the in the long run, it's better than playing against younger kids. Was Shaw always that tall? Yes. Okay. He was always taller than than, than all of us. Okay, it does not surprise me. No, he's always been dominant. Okay. Yeah. yeah no, he had twenty two. Riley had twenty one last night, yeah. and uh, was, uh, ooh, trying to remember, someone else had ten. But uh, yeah, no, they had a good night last night. Yeah. They had a big win. Um, so it, it, uh, I'm guessing you guys you you guys stay in contact for the most part. Yeah, I, yeah. I I mean that's another group of kids who started at they started varsity as freshmen. For right. Sure. So that's they were kind of in the same boat, mm-hmm. just to a higher extent. You know, they have a they have a C squad on JV, and they just jumped right up. So right. I probably wouldn't have jumped right up, but that's yeah. We keep in contact. Okay. Yeah. How much How much did going back to practicing against guys like Shaw, who were just physical freaks you know just yeah. just huge uh super athletic you know how much how much does playing against competition like that do for you on a skills level uh and especially playing you know figuring out what you have to do in the post um at first it's really depressing yeah when you're playing against a team like that and you fall down like 20 to 4 and mm-hmm. then you get to halftime, you might be down by 35 points, but you realize that this isn't a game that we're out to win. This is a game that we're out to get better. Right. You know, and that's where you figure out that this is a time where, say you're a point guard, it's time to work on your ball handling mm-hmm. skills. If, if you're a post, it's time to work on your up and under move or something like that. You might be going against six six guy, you might be six foot one, so you just gotta work harder than he does at that point. And just just hope for the best for the rest of the game. Cause right. He's bigger than you. I don't know how to say it, you know. Okay. Uh, what about uh, what's your favorite favorite 
move uh, in, in the paint and uh, you know outside of the paint on the perimeter or whatnot. Okay. I love the move where you dribble in and then you spin out and you look like you're gonna take a fadeaway shot and then the big guy jumps up and then you go right underneath. Okay, for up the and under. Yeah, yeah, up. Yeah, that. Yeah. You get guys who who are big who just they just want to swatch you in front right. of your home crowd and then you just make them look stupid. Looks like low hanging fruit yeah. to them. Yeah, and then yeah. it's even better if the guy on the other side sucks up and you just dump it off to the post. You mm -hmm. little dish pass down in there and that's always the best. Okay. Have you been doing that for quite a while? That, that's that been one of my moves for okay. a while, back to when I was smaller. I mean, I've, I've never really been the biggest guy on the court, so mm -hmm. when I was smaller and it was like mouse in the house, down in the bottom, and right. I would just have to find a way to get it in, you okay. know, and it that's it worked. So I just kind of rolled with it. One thing I wish, I wish you, you saw, and there's a reason why we don't see this in the NBA uh, anymore. Uh, the reason is because it's a low percentage shot, but uh, for me growing up watching like Shaq, uh, yeah. you know, Akeem, a couple of those bigs had, had the uh, hook, and especially guys like Barkley. Barkley's 6'6 yeah. six, six yeah. as a center, you know, so, yeah. uh, and, and so they do the hook shot, and that was always mine, but some, watching some of the smaller guys play in the post, for me, you know, being 5'9", it's like, yeah. just like, how did kid do that? I wish, I wish I saw that more as a kid, because yeah, yeah. It's, it's tough being small in the post. It is. <laughs> Sometimes you see that hook shot with a five, with like a five nine kid, and sometimes uh, it's just like a hail mary pass, right? You know, and it's just like eyes closed, just turn and chuck it up there. But I mean, sometimes you see little guys who have been working on that, right? And it's it works. Yeah, it's it crazy. works. It's crazy to see. Yeah, if it, you, the thing is, you got to practice it for like an hour a day. Oh uh, yeah, you know, half an hour a day it's, in order to get it down. Yeah, that's not easy. <laughs> you got a big guy in your hip, and you're able to kind of just launch it over, mm -hmm. and that's. It's always great to watch, though. Right. See something like that. It's like, wow, five nine over six six six. You gotta be kidding me. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Old Muggsy Muggsy Bogues. Another. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, where do you see the uh, the team? You know, uh, now that you guys have played several games, you're in the league play, and you know, where do you see the team finishing this year? Well, we all hope we can make it to state. You mm -hmm. know, that's always that's always the goal. Um, we know who's who's really good in our league and who's more of the weaker teams, and we know we we, we know where we stand. Right. You know, we may not we may not be the best team in the league right now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we lost, we lost last night to right. Columbia Advance, but we know that you know we can go up from here. You know, all, right. all we can do is get better. You know, if if we get better, then who knows? Maybe on Saturday we play Columbia Advanced again, maybe mm -hmm. we go down there and we beat them by five points. If you do that, then I know Nacelle blew out Columbia Advanced, which is the team that's way out there. Right. But, um, so I know that team, that team's gonna be hard to beat, and that team, that team's a, that's a state contender, mm -hmm. you know? When, right. In the past we played against that Tohola, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. They've been, that's that's like, we don't play against them this year, and I wish we did, because they're a very good measuring stick. Okay. Because you really don't know how good you are until you play against them. Right. Because it's, it, I hate to make like a like a the look towards like the NFL, but like if you're like the Patriots and you're playing against the Bills and the Dolphins every single week, you don't yeah. really know how good you are until you play like the Steelers. Right. And then you find out that you beat them seventeen right. to fourteen. Hey, you're a pretty good team. Right. That's kind of like us in this situation with Tola or Nacelle is another one, or even Columbia Advance, who's going to be going deep this year. Mm -hmm. And we know that. I mean, we didn't play very well last night. So I think that's pretty obvious. But if we have a better game. We can beat that team, right? You know, we can make it close against Nacelle too. So you, know, I think we're gonna go deep. I think that all of us would be happy if we get deep, and maybe we don't make it to state, but we get like one round out, and we play Nacelle like hard. You know, we're maybe we lose by five, ten points. I think we're all gonna be pretty happy with this season, just knowing that sure. we can build on it. You right. know, I think all yeah. of us are underclassmen. We have one senior on varsity, so yeah, we have basically the same team next year. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the uh, the NFL reference. Uh, yeah. there, there's there's another in pro sports. There's a saying, you know, uh, especially baseball and football, it's getting to the dance. You know, it, that's all yeah. that matters because uh, you know, especially in baseball, we, as we've seen, and definitely football, where there's typically a wild card team in the Super Bowl. Yeah, you know, and and kind of a similar situation uh, with the World Series, where you know. It's it's a it's a toss up of who's going to end up in that championship yeah. round, and so you know just getting there is the important part. And what happens from there is what happens from there. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you for coming in. Of course. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, there will be a story uh, up Friday morning. Um, so check that out. It'll be, uh, you know, Olivia Sprague, Shelby Blodgett, obviously Ryan Ransom here, um, and a few others in the area who have really uh, stood out as underclassmen uh, on the hoop scene. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks to Sterling Auto Group, and I'll catch you next time.